you know, for people that just use these medicines recreationally, they may laugh about the fact that, you know, they saw a dinosaur, you know, in right. one night when they were out partying. Um, but if you're trying to integrate an experience, you're more being curious about that dinosaur or what that dinosaur means to you or, you know, how that dinosaur or what it represents, you know, may help to heal something that is keeping you stuck in a place in your life. Psychedelic experiences can be quite powerful and life-changing. But there are also all forms of consciousness-expanding experiences that may challenge one's old paradigm. Sometimes even taking a big leap with a significant life decision can challenge one's psyche. So, what is integration? It may well be the act of weaving together new levels of understanding that arise with new experiences into our evolving life stories. It is to provide the framework for ourselves so that we may benefit from new insights. Something like a psychedelic experience can be a fleeting moment or a new milestone. Without integration, our psyche may be susceptible to so many things, be it splitting from one's reality or ego inflation. The path of consciousness expansion beckons us to harness wisdom and discernment. Welcome back to the Soul Space Podcast. We're your hosts, Adrian and Thal. So today we do our first four-way conversation. We have Dr. Susan Scharf and Rebecca Hendricks with us. Together they founded One Integration in New York City to raise awareness around the mindful and safe use of psychedelics for growth and healing. They offer individual as well as group integration. Dr. Scharf is a board-certified internal medicine physician and she's also received advanced training in functional medicine and mind-body medicine. She has completed the Multidisciplinary Association for Psychedelic Studies Therapist Training Program and is currently the study physician for the Phase 3 clinical trials for MDMA therapy for PTSD in New York. She's also trained with the Psychedelic Education and Continuing Care Program and the Integrative Harm Reduction Psychotherapy Program from the Center for Optimal Living. Rebecca Hendricks is a licensed marriage and family therapist. She completed her Master of Spiritual Psychology and her Master of Counseling Psychology from the University of Santa Monica. She has a coaching degree from the Coaches Training Institute. She's also a certified Imago therapist. And she's completed the Center for Optimal Living Psychedelic Education Program 101 and 102 workshops and is in a clinician group for harm reduction and psychedelic integration. Whether you're psychedelic curious or an active explorer, we hope you find this conversation useful. It is our pleasure to bring you Dr. Susan Scharf and Rebecca Hendricks. Welcome, Susan and Rebecca, to Soul Space uh, Podcast. Thank you. We are happy to be here. Yeah, thank you for having us. We're so excited. Thank you for coming on. <laughs> Um, I guess a place where we want to start from is um, what got you interested in psychedelic psychotherapy and why? <laughs> All right. Oh, should I start? Well, I start or do you want me to start? go ahead. Okay. <laughs> um, I am a, I'm a traditionally trained psychotherapist. But within that, I also have a specialization in spiritual psychology, mm -hmm. which is helping people to look at their unfilled issues as a means of growing spiritually. <laughs> and in doing that, um, I've, I noticed over the past few years, especially with my clients that are on medication and taking the traditional medications, they don't always work for everybody. 
for the people that they work with, they're a godsend. But for the people that um, don't find success, it's it's really really hard. And some people that um, are going on them have a lot of side effects, uh, even in increased thoughts of suicide going on them and coming off of them can be a lot harder than expected for some people. And I guess it was maybe a year or so ago, um, I've been a fan of Gabor Mate for a long time with the work that he's done with addiction and looking at addiction at all addiction um, is rooted in trauma. And uh, in following him and going to some of his talks, he talks about um, sometimes doing ayahuasca and leading some ayahuasca trips. And so um, a opportunity came up in New York where I work to do a training for clinicians called Psychedelics 101 and 102 with the Center for Optimal Living. And so I did that last year and was just fascinated by all the information that they provided about what, how these medicines can be used and are being used in clinical trials to help people heal from things like OCD and depression and PTSD in ways that the psychopharmacological industry just aren't, often by using them once or twice or, or three times. So um, that's how I became interested, mm -hmm. just by kind of seeing what's going on in my practice, having some personal experience. One of my best friends committed suicide um, a number a number of years ago, right when she was coming off some psychiatric medications. Mm -hmm. um, so it's all, always just been kind of a feeling inside of we just don't have enough to offer, and that our mental health system is a bit a bit broke. We need mass mental health, and we need more options for people that are in pain. And so that's kind of what got me interested. Mm -hmm. And just for listeners, I wanted to point out that that was Rebecca, because we haven't done a, a four-way conversation, yeah, so yeah. people are only hearing your voices, so I wanted to match the voice with a name, so that was Rebecca, and thank you, and I wanted True. to... Yeah. Yes, thank you. I'm Rebecca, <laughs> and I'm a, psycho a holistic psychotherapist. <laughs> and you guys could hear okay? Yes. yes. Okay, good. So I'm Susan, mm -hmm. and how I got interested, I really just the process of my it's a longer process because I trained in internal medicine mm. and really somehow had an awareness of other ways that we can heal, which is not really being offered to us in our traditional training, whether that's psychological training, um, psychiatric training, medical training. And I just started exploring these other ways of approaching things. And I learned about functional medicine and I was like, Oh great. Okay. That, feels right. Let me go to that as fast as I can and, and see what that offers me, um, in terms of helping people. And it really opened my eyes to other ways of healing, um, and thinking about our body and our system and the connectedness of all of our parts and systems, um, and how they affect each other. So I've kind of been approaching ever since I started medical school, just approaching everything from that. It's all connected. Mm -hmm. So, uh, so I, I do practice holistic medicine as well, and it's really the mind, body, spirit, soul. It is all connected, and it might sound a bit cheesy, but all these parts affect each other and, and things that we go through and just thinking that um, especially things like stress and anxiety and trauma and um, these are not just things you take a pill for mm -hmm. um, and expect it to, to fix a problem that has affected your life in all these areas. And, and although, you know, natural and holistic medicine uh, might be geared toward non-medicine type things, a lot of these substances, medicines we talk about are plants. And even then there's, it's just, um, it really touches upon all the aspects, all the aspects of a whole person to me and allows that person true healing, deep healing, connected healing, um, and support. And when you see people getting better mm -hmm. and you, you can be with people getting better and from these modalities, it's just undeniable, mm -hmm. um, the help that it offers. Absolutely. I mean, um, it's like, 
you have this amazing role um, of like bridging between sort of Western medicine and holistic medicine. And in many ways too, Rebecca, you shared like, you know, as a, a spiritual psychotherapist, you know, mainstream psychotherapy tends to maybe not look at the spiritual aspects of things. But, you know, it's like there has to be more bridging, more conversation between the different parts of, of sort of medicine, psychology, psychiatry, psychotherapy, and and holistic approaches to things. So, you know, that's um, an interesting space that you both occupy. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Can you guys uh, share with us the maybe the origin story for One Integration so that you guys both uh, founded this uh, company and, and it seems like you're now offering services that are uh, within this, the psychedelic um, integration space. Can you talk about what inspired that and, and what, uh, tell us a little bit about One Integration? Sure. <laughs> uh, well, we actually, we met in a clinician's group, a clinician's consultation group for other therapists that have had some advanced training in um, working with patients who are interested in psychedelic, you know, healing through the use of psychedelics um, through that Center for Optimal Living training. And so when we met... Um, we started chatting and we realized that, well, a lot of what we do in our clinician group is talk about integrating these experiences and different clinicians will bring forward case studies about um, patients that are having challenges and in integrating and we will all brainstorm about the best way to help that patient to maybe integrate the experience into their life. And so we realized that... Um, that there's a real need to have a service available for people to integrate. There's a lot of integration, well, within specialized communities, there's some integration circles. Um, some, yeah. there, are, there are some that exist. Mm -hmm. But we didn't, um, we, um, didn't know of another group per se that is formulated uh, by a psychotherapist and a doctor mm -hmm. that because there's a little bit of like a middle ground. The integration circles, um, the ones that I've been to anyway, tend to have a lot of people that are quite experienced in psychedelics um, and that have used a good many of them. And um, it didn't seem like there's a lot available for people that were curious mm -hmm. or who might have had a recent experience in Costa Rica or someplace, people that were experimenting on their own. I started to see in my practice um, people that are flying to different countries to use ayahuasca or things like that, um, but weren't necessarily integrating when they came back. And so jointly, we just decided it would be a great add-on to our existing businesses to make something like that available. And so we just, it was, it's also fun and exciting because we both have a passion mm -hmm. for this work. Mm -hmm. And so we wanted to figure out a way that we could work together and also help people. Mm -hmm. Yes, uh, that was Rebecca, and this is Susan, just to keep with that. Um, I also want to add to that because that's exactly right, that um, two things. We both, I think, really want to provide this uh, service to people as a, a real safe place to really uh, expand upon either these experiences or, and, and we, we also talk about peak experiences. It doesn't have to be with a specific substance, but a peak experience and really bring whatever shows up to the light and learn from it and grow from it. Um, but also, uh, as in many communities, there's not always therapeutically, and I'm not saying there's only one way mm -hmm. and I'm not saying, um, I'll finish my sentence. I'm not, there's not always therapeutically trained people there available to support people through difficult times. And not that you have to have a certain type of training or that you need to, you know, have a psychoanalysis background, but some people that are going through these underground communities may need a lot more support than that community can provide. Yeah. And, and, and we do have the training to provide that kind of support. Mm -hmm. Amazing. And I think we also feel like, you know, fingers crossed, this is 
this is the future. This this could happen, you know, in the next five years. This is so. happening. This is happening. As we That's speak. true. It is happening. Um, yeah. And so we want to be prepared. And there's there's still so much stigma attached to um, the use of psychedelics for healing, um, even with ketamine, which is perfectly legal. There's stigma attached, and so we wanted to, you know, kind of even proactively start to educate people or talk about it in a normal way from that people will start to see this as uh, a possibility to help their loved ones or to, su to suggest to a loved one that really needs help and is struggling. Mm -hmm. I mean, clearly that we were talking about very like um, powerful substances and um, people might go through, you know, powerful experiences. And so what does integration mean? H how can we integrate? Like if someone goes th through something that's so um, either traumatic yeah. or, you know, something from the past, how does integration look like? Well, so integration, I mean, basically what it is, is using the information you've learned and consciously incorporating it into your life. Yes. to make changes to help you create your best life. Mm -hmm. um, but integration in general is, is, is being really mindful with your use of it and then inquiring afterwards and doing anything that you can do to make your life better because of it. You know, for people that just use these medicines recreationally, they may laugh about the fact that, you know, they saw a dinosaur, you know, in right. one night when they were out party. Um, but if you're trying to integrate an experience, you're more being curious about that dinosaur or what that dinosaur means to you or, you know, how that dinosaur or what it represents, you know, may help to heal something that is keeping you stuck in a place in your life. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's using, um, the experience and any information you got to, to be really, curious and ask yourself questions and give yourself time and space and patience in order for any answers or help to come through you and to use certain tools that may assist you to do that. And again, I think it's bringing mindfulness, mindful awareness to the process, Con consciousness to more consciousness, mm -hmm. <laughs> um, giving more space for consciousness more consciousness to happen. Um, and of course that's going to be still defined by the person going through it. Mm -hmm. So, uh, for example, if someone has, I mean, I'm just going to use ayahuasca for, for an example, because it's one of the most powerful, um, mind expanders or yes. consciousness expanders out there, um, in, on our planet as a natural product. Right. Um, but there are people that um, have ceremonies with ayahuasca that are legal when they go abroad um, in certain areas. But some people, it could be months before they're even able to begin the processing and maybe even a year or longer before there's even some awareness of some of the subtleties from the experience. Yeah. So every every person's experience is different with, with, uh, with these medicines. And the, the, the processing of that experience can be very different as well. So it's very much guided by the, the person going through the experience. And, um, and like Rebecca's saying, taking the time, even finding the ability to, to allow for time and processing and openness mm -hmm. to the process. Yeah. yeah, it's really just giving giving yourself the gift of time um, and intention to to get as much out of this type of experience that you that you can, and that doing the actual experience is just the beginning of it. Yes, it's, it's the journey that you take afterwards, um, and how you can make your life better, to be a better person, to be more loving, mm -hmm. to heal whatever it is that you know may be keeping you stuck. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I wanted to ask, uh, perhaps what does disintegration look like in your experience uh, working with people? What might be some signs that, oh, someone might not be integrating well? What would that look like um, in, in a real case scenario? 
a sign that somebody may not be integrating well, um, maybe not being able to function in their daily life, um, finding it really hard to, you know, go back into their job, go back into their life, go back into their relationships, um, you know, showing some signs of depression or increased anxiety, isolation, isolation, you know, but to the extent that it really interferes with their peace and serenity, um, and then going back to maybe old coping mechanisms, you know, which, which could be self-medicating in one form or another, um, isolating, shutting down, um, or throwing themselves into, you know, work or exercise or just something where they're just, you know, instead of being with what might need to come up or getting support, they just kind of go into filling the time you know, <laughs> autopilot to fill in the time or, or, or become, um, affected in such a way that they really can't go about their day to day. Does that make sense? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. It's an, it's an interesting, um, way to think about integration, to think about disintegration because also, um, we do have, uh, discussions around integrations ourselves as psycho psychotherapy students also interested in, in the work of psychedelics and just, you know, um, thinking about e ego inflation or ego deflation that can happen too with, um, with psychedelics and in the psychedelic mm -hmm. community as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Good point. What's coming to my mind is just the, there's such a huge potential for people to experience spiritual emergence, right? Or, or you can even call a spiritual emergency depending on how rapid uh, the changes are happening. And, mm -hmm. and that, that coincides with this potential for inflation, possibly for, for somebody to come out of a peak experience thinking they've had more insight than yeah. they really had or more, more healing than, than what actually happened. And so I think, uh, at one point you mentioned, you know, it, it could take a long time. It could be months perhaps for, for, for some folks after peak experience to, to begin to notice even, mm -hmm. um, that things are starting to, uh, to, to shift. And, you know, mm -hmm. um, I, I wanted to, to ask you about the role of, of practice, you know, cause the thing, you know, most people when they seek these experiences are not doing it every day. And so they're filling most okay. of their life with, no. with just the regular mundane, mundane activities. So what's, what's the role of having daily practices perhaps to come back to? Yeah, that's good. Cause that's what we would talk about anyway. So that's excellent. <laughs> <laughs> Way to segue into that. Um, <laughs> yeah, I think even just when we talk about creating space and time and it, space in your life, it's, that that's the way to do that is to have that daily time for time with yourself, time for processing, whether that's sitting and not actually processing, but just being quiet or time for meditation, um, or being out in nature, uh, that beingness with what is, um, is actually some of the ripest time for processing to happen. Mm -hmm on its own without efforting even, um, that is the best time. Um, and we even have, we even created a little list. We have our little notes in front of us of some of the things that people could do. Um, where is it? Oh, right. I mean, so, these, so we have, um, just a, um, a long list of integration tools that we find that, uh, we've compiled just from talking to a lot of yeah. people that have integrated successfully. Um, but things on it are things like working with a psychedelic friendly therapist. Yeah. And in terms of what you were talking about a minute ago, it, it's really important, I think, to work with somebody before you go and then after you go. Yeah. Because before you go, you can talk about what you want to get out of the experience, mm -hmm. why you're thinking about doing it now. You know, for example, if you are somebody that's working on um, a core issue of not feeling good enough. And then you set that as your intention when you go into your experience and you come out of it thinking like, wow, I'm done with that. I'm totally done with that. I know it now. I feel it <laughs> in every cell of my body. Yeah. But maybe the, the, the therapist that's working with you could help point out that like, I know that you got a lot of information on that 
in your experience, but maybe you still are struggling it with it a little bit because I, you just told me about how you acted or felt when you didn't get the promotion that you wanted. Mm -hmm. So, you know, having that continuation as somebody that knows you before and after, um, could be really supportive in terms of maybe helping to manage expectations or to even point out possible realities about what has actually occurred versus what their real world experience is. Um, but we have found and encourage everybody to find the right modality that works for them to in time space so that anything that can come up, you know, has a space to do mm -hmm. so. You know, as Susan was saying earlier, doing a plant medicine or a psychedelic is not at all the only means to grow spiritually or to you know, get information that could help you move along a path. It tends to be something that makes some of these things happen a, a good bit quicker um, for some people. Um, but slowing down your life in general for most people, especially people that we know living in New York City, <laughs> is a really good idea because it is often when we're running or when we're meditating or when we're communing with nature that we do get insights or information or downloads, so to speak, the same type of information that people report getting when having these experiences. So if you can have a spiritual practice that you're practicing preferably before you go, um, meditation <laughs> or um, breath work, um, journaling, journaling yes. um, you know, any of those, Qigong, um, qigong um, just being in nature, chanting, any of those type of things, just yoga would be good because then you have that to get back to. Um, it's almost like you've started it and then it's like, ah, yes, those are my things that help me to expand my mind or, you know, when I do those things, I tend to get information. Mm -hmm. So doing those things after a ceremony might also be that way that your, you know, inner counselor, your inner self can make a connection with you to give you that information that's somehow been stored back away as you come back online to real life. And on that, just on that same note, even though we're not, it's not really what you brought up, you know, there's the talk about, um, is it the medicine? Is it you? Yes, and yes. I know we both feel quite strongly that all that information is in there. And in fact, some say these medicines help you remember, remember your, yourself, get back in touch with yourself. And, um, we do feel that it's, it's all you. And it's enhancing you. It's helping you find those parts of yourself or remember those parts of yourself or reconnect to those parts of yourself. Yeah. Yeah. Th yeah. That is important to mention because, you know, um, you know, some people might hear this, especially people who haven't tried psychedelics and like, oh, really? Like, like really psychedelics is going to solve everything. But just knowing that it's it's just a tool or an amplifier yeah. of your own consciousness is, is an important yeah. reminder. Yeah. Yeah. For sure. Yeah, I mean, they tend to be, you know, I was listening um, to somebody talk the other day and they were saying that they interviewed somebody, I think it was Michael Pollan said that he interviewed somebody that had been in the smoking cessation trial using um, psilocybin. And the woman said that she got this very kind of banal, um, you know, information, which is like, wow, I should really stop smoking. It's not good for you. And I shouldn't kill myself that way. And there's a lot of other things to see in the world. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's, those are the types of information that you get and you know, this kind of going into it, but coming out of an experience, you know, it in a really authoritative right. type of way. Yeah. And so then it's, you know, okay, now that I know this, not just thought it, I like have feel it almost in a lot of the cells in my body, what tools would support me to anchor it in and live from that place? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, what I, what I also notice is that there's a real hunger for community, you know, for people who have come out of these experiences yes. and not knowing where to turn to because perhaps their friend group isn't friendly, you know, to talk about this stuff or their family. Um, can you maybe touch on that? Because I, I see that's one of the, the goals you have for uh, one integration yes. is to build community and to do sort of group processing. Yeah. 
Yeah, that's a that's good talker. She should talk. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's, a great, that's a great point because that is one of the reasons why we got together to do this because yeah. um, especially living in a city like New York, mm-hmm. um, community is just becoming more and more important with everything that's going on in the world, um, with everything that's going on politically. Like people need a place um, to call home people, the biggest gift you so can much. ever give anybody is the gift of attention. Yes. So being able to, um, provide a space for people to talk about these experiences, um, to feel safe, um, to know that that's something that they can get back to. I mean, just in, in, if you just take psychotherapy alone, a lot of the reasons why it works is because somebody has a safe space um, to be listened to. Mm -hmm. And most of the time people in life, when we're speaking, we're thinking about the next thing we're going to say when the other person stops. And so, but in so doing, we're not necessarily listening and being there for somebody else, giving them that gift of attention and to do it in community, um, in a group is just, it just makes it for the people that are open and benefit from that. It just makes it so much more supportive and can help their process um, exponentially. Yes, I completely agree. And um, I think also one of those important aspects of integration and integration in groups is being able to hear other people that, that may be going through similar but different things or hearing someone express something about themselves that really resonates with you and you feel a kinship there or that you're all souls searching for things and, and creating, I will say it, a loving Mm -hmm. and safe place. We, I think we really all do want that Mm -hmm. and need that in our society has not been constructed around those values. So we do need to find a way to create them for ourselves and, and I think, again, safe is key. You know, you can still have a community of people like in these underground settings that are trying to do that and they're not always creating the safest place either. Mm-hmm. So it's, again, being mindful of um, safety and, um, yeah, having that community is key because to, to try to do this on one's own, um, that's just yes. it's really difficult. Yeah. Um, I mean, speaking of safety, um, we're, another thing that we'd like to know about, and I, I don't know if you guys do work around that, is the harm reduction model. Um, yeah. Yeah. Can you yes. speak to that, please? Yeah. Yeah. I'd love to speak to that. That's one of the, other than integration, that's one of the things that we love to talk about that we think everybody um, could benefit okay. by knowing about. I actually think that the... Um, there, I mean, there's harm reduction models, the integrative, well, the Center for Optimal Living is one of the places near us that takes this approach um, for the integrative harm reduction psychotherapy. And I think that could really be applied to everything in every aspect of your life. Mm-hmm. It's, it's not just putting things in boxes, it's considering the whole picture. Um, so, I mean, we really, we're calling it mindful engagement mm-hmm. uh, as an easier way to kind of make it make sense when we're talking about it. Cause not everybody wants to hear integrative harm reduction yes. Yes. <laughs> as a term, right. but you know, it's starting, uh, hope this makes sense, but you know, when we start to talk with people about, um, you know, even why, if they've never had a psychedelic experience or a peak experience, you know, start from the beginning, what are your motivations? And we have actually a whole process that we've thought through of understanding one thing is the, um, understanding your motivation, mm-hmm. um, choosing a facilitator, a guide, thinking about the environment you're going to be in, the people that are, you're going to be around you. Mm-hmm. Um, you're our own, you guys paused. You're still there. Good. <laughs> uh, your own physical and mental health. Um, it's thinking way in advance of, well, first of all, what do I, what do I want to get out of this? Right. If I do get out of this, what I want to get out of this, what is that going to mean for my life? How will that feel? Mm-hmm. And if I don't, what will that mean? Or how will that feel? Um, and that's just even the beginning. Rebecca, do you want to continue? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. 
Um, so, I mean, one thing that we like to tell people is that there's a there's a lot of positive talk that is going on around yes. using these substances, um, and it can get it can be really easy to just get wrapped up in that and say, "Oh, well, I want to do it too." Absolutely. But our one of our main messages is like stop and pause and think and focus and, and ask yourself why it's not. It's not for everybody mm-hmm. any more than going on psychiatric medication is for everybody. Um, but, you know, you have to know yourself well enough to know that you're doing it for the right reasons and to know and to do your homework in terms of, you know, what could happen, you know, knowing your history, um, considering your set and your setting, your mindset is so important what you're feeling as you're going into an experience and knowing, um, you know, for example, if you've recently gone through uh, a long-term relationship breakup and you're at that mm-hmm. stage in the very beginning where you're just flooded with emotions yeah. and you're crying and you're even having trouble, like knowing which emotions you're feeling, it may not be the best time to do one of these experiences. If you're somebody that had been grieving your relationship for quite a while, um, and we're, you know, we're not feel, being flooded with emotions, then it actually could be a good time to get some information that would help you heal and, and move forward. Right. But it's the process of just slowing down, doing research. There's a lot of amazing resources online. We have a great comprehensive list on our website at one-integration.com um, to be able to just look at all the different scenarios, look at, you know, things to consider about medication interactions, which uh, Dr. Sharp could mm-hmm. speak to a little bit, but there's just a lot to consider. And harm reduction is about just that, like it, considering all these possible things to reduce harm as much as possible. Mm-hmm. Um, speaking of medications, like if someone is on anxiety medication or, you know, depression medication, and they really want to try psychedelics, what kind of advice would you give them, uh, Susan? Well, of course, it depends on the um, medicine that they're using and the medicine that they want to take. Um, many of the psychedelics are not compatible with antidepressants mm-hmm. and can be quite um, uh, dangerous if combined with psych- uh, with <laughs> antidepressants Um, ketamine can be combined with antidepressants and although I mean ketamine is a different it's very different from ayahuasca or MDMA um, it is something that is legal and it's able to be monitored you're able to be safely monitored by a doctor um, and it does provide support and relief for many people Mm -hmm. for depression and it's being used for some other things. It's been studied the most in depression, but so that is a possibility. Um, but in terms of advice, uh, we always say, you know, find a psychedelic literate practitioner who can really help you tease through the details before you go off and consider something. Cause of course it is not without risk to use any of these substances or medicines that they, although they're, they are have a beautiful place for healing yeah. for many people they they have risks and things can happen and have happened mm-hmm. and for for various different reasons and um and those all those aspects need to i mean you have to consider for as as a person yourself all the aspects of what you need to know no no you have to have the knowledge um and be very judicious and aware mm-hmm. before you participate in anything like this yeah and because Ketamine is already legal. Um, it's prescribed by a doctor. And so you could potentially even meet with a doctor that prescribes ketamine in order to talk about how you may be affected if ketamine is for you, or they could even be knowledgeable about the other um, medicines. Mm-hmm. Perhaps. Perhaps. Right. I mean, it's no, no guarantee, but, yes. you know. Yeah, because you brought up ketamine, I wanted to ask because so it's it's legal and um, supervised under medical um, context. I noticed you you guys offer integration for ketamine therapy. So there's there's a group coming up 
um, on your website. Can you talk about what yeah. that would look like, the structure of it? Just curious, you know, uh, to get a glimpse of um, other forms of integration groups that might be um, yeah. uh, drug specific or experience specific. Yeah, we really wanted to make this kind of uh, modeled after a group therapy experience. We want it to be a closed group that everyone has, um, we've spoken with each person individually um, before they enter this group. And it's not just for people that are already involved with ketamine therapy, but even people who are interested and want to learn more and, um, as we say, psychedelic curious. Um, so that by having this closed group of people that are committed to um, a certain period of time and a certain number of sessions that, in fact, that has its own container and safety to it so that everybody there we know is committed and um, as much as possible ready to be present um, and hold space for each other. Um, and uh, in terms of structure, what we uh, plan to do is to have like each session, somebody, the focus will be part of the time focused on them. And so they can share what they want to about their experience. And again, everybody that experiences ketamine, just as like the other medications, may have a different experience. Some people don't really remember much of their experience at all. Some people, you know, have a lot of, of memory. So, and a lot of people that are going to see psychiatrists or the anesthesiologist or the ER doctors that have set up ketamine clinics might not also have a psychotherapist yeah. or, you know, they may just have a psychiatrist. And so it's a space for them to add that piece of it in as well. And so as per structure, it'll, you know, it would be everybody sharing a little bit, but each time there's one person in particular that we can go deeper with mm -hmm. during the, you know, eight week process. Mm -hmm. And then that person also can get input from the group. Um, reflective listening, um, you know, that kind of thing. And yeah, about what Rebecca is saying, we've, we've found that ketamine is definitely, it's happening in a lot of places now and it's being, it's very helpful for a lot of people, but it's not generally provided, uh, from those practitioners who are providing the ketamine with a, any, or very little space for any kind of integration, although that might be happening with someone's private psychotherapist. Uh, we're not finding that's being combined often, if at all, mm -hmm. with the, ther the ketamine therapy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we've even spoke to a doctor recently who said that he feels that a lot of people are looking at it as just another drug. You know, you go into the office, you right. sit, you get your IV, the, some of the doctor could leave the room, Mm -hmm. um, often no music, no blindfold, I mean, no mask. Yeah. And so that can, you know, that can affect somebody's experience. So mm -hmm. even the depth of their experience. Yeah. Yeah. So, so making sure that, you know, providing a space that if somebody is considering using this, that they have as much information as possible on how to make that experience a good one for them. And if they have had one, but they're not quite sure how else they could be anchoring it in yeah. or even what happened to them, providing space for them to do that. And giving more space for transformation to occur. Yes. For transformation. Yeah. Rather than just a receptor drug phenomenon. Mm. I mean, just you mentioning that, I, I would think like what a waste to go and take him... <laughs> you know, and sit in a place and go through the experience and not be able to, um, go deep is be shame to <laughs> experience that. So yeah, well, th thank you for raising awareness. Exactly. That. Yeah. And, and especially like, cause I know you guys are in the field and studying to do more of this, but, um, maybe a lot of, and I think a lot of the people that I don't know, some people anyway that are going to do kind of they may have never even had a therapy experience. Yes. Yeah. So and I don't know, Dr. Sharp or Susan, tell me what you think, but I think of the psychedelics, it might be one that um some people could have more of a disassociative That's reaction yes. to yes. than a um right. maybe classic 
psychedelic experience. And so for, for, for those people, it could be even more challenging, but even maybe even more necessary. I don't know about more necessary, but definitely, um, a tool that they could use to try to, you know, just how does it feel to have taken it? What was that like for you? What is, what is it like if it isn't working? What if it like, what is it like if it is working? Right. Um, just to have a place, place to, to, to talk about the experience, just as if somebody were taking, um, getting a prescription for Zoloft, yeah. you unpack that with your therapist, you know, what are the side effects and how are you feeling and what do you do? You know, no, honestly, we know that that doesn't happen a lot either. Yeah. Um, that's true. We want it to, but yeah, yeah. ideally <laughs> unpack. Yeah. Yeah. Right. And, and setting expectations and moving through those and being with those feelings. Yeah. And that ideally with even as Rebecca was saying, um, an SSRI, you might start a Zoloft medication and, and ideally you would process how you're doing on that medication with your therapist or maybe even your psychiatrist, um, and how you're feeling and, and what that, what that's like and as much as we'd like to think that's happening and would like that to be happening. That's not necessarily happening everywhere either. Yeah. So I think, uh, yes, I think um, also you guys brought up an important point that not a, not a lot of people that experience psychedelics have had uh, a therapy session or don't know how a therapy session looks like. And that's important because sometimes that, that whole psychedelic experience is literally like five hours of therapy. It, it has that potential. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah, um, exactly. Yeah. I mean, the, the more that we are doing talks just to try to you know, kind of psychedelic literacy talks just to help people to understand what these medications are. Yes. Um, the more that we're realizing that a, a lot of people don't really know much about them at all. A lot of times we, a lot of times we have to even say what a shaman is mm. or what a shaman does or, you know, why, who would be a candidate for this type of medication and why would they ever do it and how to explain that it's not, they're not addictive medications. I mean, anything could be yes. ad addictive, but they're not normally after you have one of these experiences, you don't wake up saying, where can I get more? I want to do it again <laughs> because it's just such a, a powerful you know, experience that that doesn't happen. But a lot of it, a lot of just some real, you know, amazingly smart, well-educated, yes. successful people just, it's nothing that they, is in their awareness yes. about it. Yeah. And also, I, this, I don't know how this will land, so you're welcome to um, cut this out. Okay. Okay. <laughs> but I was just thinking how, you know, integration, just like therapy, you know, therapy is practicing, practicing mm -hmm. how you think about things and practice and practice. And integration also provides some of that practice. And it's a practice to, it's a, it's a practice to find ourselves again after whatever this growing up in our society or going through trauma or, or whatnot, but it's a practice just as mindfulness is. It's all kind of one and the same is, mm -hmm. is giving yourself time and space, giving yourself time to be with things, looking, being a hopefully a non-judgmental observer of your experience and, and being with that. And it's all a place for practice. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I can see where the name one integration comes from. <laughs> Love it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Thank you. Also, another thing that I'm curious about is the relational aspect of psychedelics to like even during the experience of psychedelic, like um, um, Rebecca, I think you're an Imago uh, certified therapist. And yes. um, I've heard about um, couples therapy and ketamine. Um, like, can you talk about that? Like, what's the potential? And, and I just want to throw in there also... Um, because I know Susan, you're you're involved with the MDMA trials phase three, and some of those studies yes. were conducted with couples. Yeah. I mean, so by design, they had couples go through experiences, and this is something actually last night I was I was thinking about is is realizing how potentially how useful that can be for integration yeah. that your partner, your per, perhaps your spouse, your life partner actually goes and does it with you, yeah. so you don't have yeah. to go home and actually feel possibly disconnected. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so if Explain you can... as if you could. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Hello, stranger. <laughs> exactly. Rebecca, do you I want to? Yeah. No, you. Uh, uh, you sounds like you have something to say. I like something to say. <laughs> Good. Um, I mean, I would love, I mean, I can't wait 
uh, to get to the point where um, we can do MDMA assisted psychotherapy for couples because so many of the couples yeah. that I work with, you know, either, you know, mostly one is more of a pursuer and very open with their feelings and wanting to talk and poke at the other person and the other one's more of a power and shut down and withdraws you know, when there's an argument. And so to have um, a psychedelic assisted psychotherapy session, you know, it's, and, it, and the more trauma a couple has, either one or both of them, everything gets exponentially harder to the thousandth degree because they're also feeling issues around emotional safety that often have nothing to do with their partner, but is very hard for them to block and to not act out on in ways that make them feel very disconnected to their partner. So, you know, having a situation where MDMA could be used to basically get everybody in their loving essence, which is my main goal anyway, mm -hmm. whether I'm working with individuals or with couples, is to get them into their most heart-centered self and then to speak to your partner um, from that place and feeling the emotions from that place versus the hard side of, you know, most of the time people might be speaking in the more defensive hard side of a feeling like anger, mm -hmm. but underneath that there's hurt yeah. and to get them to speak from that place because it's in, it's in that place that a corrective emotional experience could happen that they then could start to do at home. Mm -hmm. And that's where healing occurs when people are relating from that space versus just the surface I'm so upset because you're five minutes late to our movie and yeah. you don't care about my time and all of that. So I would love that. I'm not familiar with the ketamine assisted couples therapy. Mm -hmm. um, I am more familiar in and, and, or imagining what it would look like. Yeah. With uh, MDMA. With the MDMA. Right. Do you know anything? Have you heard anything about couples? I know of people that have tried things, mm -hmm. but I actually haven't heard of that on that. I would love to hear about it. Um, yeah, what's happening with that? And I know about the couples study. I think isn't Anne even part of that? Um, yeah, or was part of that? But I don't know the actual findings. Although, um, yeah, I guess my question was my, more like, yeah, it's, yeah, it's more. Not, it's not about the actual medicine, but the potential of psychedelics and oh, couples I was gonna therapy. Say my intuition, and yeah, <laughs> I mean, I have a dream of also providing this to perhaps adult families. Yeah. Um, for, you know, for healing yes. all of those things that happen. Oh, such a place for, I mean, just, just even with the PTSD study, I think it, what it allows that, that layer to be peeled off of having to react of the, of such the, what comes up with all the, the PTSD symptoms and experiences and flashbacks and the, the gamut of things it allows the system to almost like take that layer off and not have to be constantly reacting and protecting so that the inner, the feelings, the knowledge, the, the other things are going on, just like Rebecca's talking about, instead of being that defensive mode, yeah. um, from that, that feeling hurt, but being defensive and seeming anger, just being able to be in that place, feeling those, those hurt feelings, or, I mean, there's so many different things that can happen in those instances, but, um, I think, of course, the study in order to move things forward in our society had to be focused on a thing. Mm -hmm. So PTSD was chosen, and I think it's a very good choice, but the implications of MDMA's use for so many things are uh, very obvious to the both of us. Yeah, uh, It sounds like to you guys as well, and we feel that it could be beneficial in so many different areas for healing, no doubt, absolutely, with, with uh, couples, uh, with families, with um yeah so many places mother daughter father, yeah i was son, just thinking goodness. mother daughter father son <laughs> right? siblings right yeah <laughs> there'll be no wars in the Disney world <laughs> i know imagine well, it's amazing absolutely you can reimagine family trips and you know, take it to a whole other <laughs> definition like a new disney yeah <laughs> okay i didn't mean to make it into it's not a toy um <laughs> but i yeah that's kind of something in my uh, a heart that I think about is being able to do these for sure relational 
connective experiences. Yeah. Sort of coming from that heart space versus ego uh, space. Deeply want them. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, just as we as we bring things to a close, could could you guys share uh, resources that might be helpful for people who are listening? Either they are curious, uh, pre-experience, we mentioned maybe peri-experience, they're really close to doing something, or, or post, they're still integrating. Um, any helpful resources you can point to? Gosh. Um, well, what do you think? well, of course, Michael Pollan's book is very helpful. Um, he's... He's so good at what he does. And so we definitely, that is a, a place for resources. Um, we refer to that a lot. Rebecca mentioned our website for resources. I mean, there are, um, there's one called, I was going to say Arrowhead. No, but yeah. Arrowhead mm-hmm. was an amazing say. one of just chock full of, of information. The one thing about Arrowhead is that, you know, you, it's a, it's, it's anything, mm-hmm. right? So you have to know that you're coming to it. Um, that one person's experience again may not be yours and that this is information gathered from a number of people and is not, it can't be taken one piece at a time. It's kind of looking at the whole. Mm -hmm. So you're not getting, I mean, I guess they do have a lot of different resources in there, but it's not uh, been combined into one nugget that you can just bite. It's, Mm -hmm. it's a larger. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, shakruna.net is an amazing one started by Bea Labat, mm. um, psychedelics today. Mm. Um, well, the center for optimal living, they have a psychedelic program.com maps.org, which is one of the nonprofits that is doing a lot of the MDMA work research. You know, these nonprofits are the ones that are moving these drugs forward into getting them licensed because they're not being funded by, um, the FDA or, you know, a lot of bigger companies aren't necessarily interested in getting involved in something that you're going to take once or twice or three times. Traditionally, the bigger companies are invested in something you're going to take every day for the rest of your life. Mm-hmm. So all the reason why these are moving forward is because of um, private donations and then the um, trials that are being done by MAPS, by the um, Hefner, Hefner Institute by, um, for, um, yeah. Mm-hmm. Awesome. Amazing. Thank you so much for your time, ladies. That was, that was a lot of fun. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much. Such a pleasure. Despite the silent pain of your closed heart and your rough skin, you will be loved still, despite your deaf ears in the morning of birds that sing by your window sill. You will be loved still, even though you hide it, your soul, in your various miserly ways, you are loved. You will be loved, even though my letters will remain unanswered, and you would have forgotten that lovers don't finally meet somewhere, they are in each other all along. You have forgotten, you have forgotten that you are loved, that you are love. We hope you enjoyed this episode. Next week, we talk about sound and healing with sound meditation expert Alexandra Tunis. If you enjoy what we're doing and want to support us, please leave a review on iTunes. We'd love to hear your suggestions for future topics and guests. You can let us know on social at soulspacepod or info at soulspacepodcast.com. As always, thanks for tuning in. Until next time.